watching Gravitas. The anti-government protests in Iran are showing no signs of quelling. The death toll from the agitation that began last week has risen to 21 as leaders in Tehran struggle to respond to the most serious internal crisis in nearly a decade. Six days of demonstrations showed no signs of easing as the anger from the streets found new targets. What began as frustration over Iran's sluggish economy has broadened into open defiance of the country's Islamic leadership itself. Iran's establishment was clearly caught off guard by the speed and ferocity of these protests. What's happening today is the largest outpouring of opposition to the state since the disputed 2009 presidential election. Iran's supreme, supreme leader Ayatollah Khamenei blamed the country's enemies for stirring up unrest in Iran. In his first remarks since the demonstrations erupted last Thursday, Khamenei has accused the nation's enemies of joining forces against Iran. Now, Iran's foreign ministry hit back at Donald Trump after his tweet saying that the U.S. president should focus on quote-unquote homeless and hungry people in the U.S. So what really is happening and who is fueling these protests? A nation of 60 million people on the boil. Hundreds of Iranians are out on the streets, some protesting their dismal economic situation, others the rigidity of the religious institutions that rule Iran. Many Iranian demonstrators, it would seem, want their country to stop supporting Syria and militant organizations like Hamas and Hezbollah and divert that funding to solving the country's dire economic crisis instead. But the protest in Iran spreading through social media is it really all that surprising. The Russians left their mark on elections in the United States as they did on a controversial and banned referendum in Spain's Catalonia. So are the sudden demonstrations in Iran, the first of their kind since 2009, entirely indigenous? Or have the people come out on the streets knowing that the world is watching and possibly wielding the puppet strings? President Hassan Rouhani saying on Monday, and I'm quoting, the protests were being pushed by Saudi Arabia, which was trying to destabilize the country along with the US and Israel. Let's take a look at the foes that the Iranian president is talking about and what their motivation could be. 14 demonstrators have already, in fact, 21 have lost their lives and uh, the riots show no signs of abating. The U.S. president, Donald Trump, had said, and I quote, the good people of Iran want change. Iran's people are what their leaders fear the most. Saudi prince Salman has called Iran, Iran's leader Ayatollah Khamenei, and I'm quoting again, the new Hitler of the Middle East. The main thrust of the protest may be Iran's abysmal economic situation and growing joblessness and yet rumors that Israel and Saudi Arabia are newfound friends in the Middle East along with the US have engineered the protests in Iran won't die down. Oil rich Iran was brought back into focus as a rogue state by US President Donald Trump from the day he took office last January. And there are astoundingly loud claims emanating from the US. What stands out starkly is Washington's determination and the hint of some imminent action. That's right, the mood was set exactly a year ago when American President Donald Trump brought Iran right back into the spotlight. Under his predecessor, Barack Obama, Iran had signed a nuclear agreement with the United States and other countries. But under President Trump, Iran has over the past year been painted black again and this time as the biggest rogue state in West Asia. First, President Trump decertified the nuclear agreement. Then, and much to Tehran's annoyance, the American president began and continues to refer to the Persian Gulf as the Arabian Gulf. The move pleased Israel and Saudi Arabia, both of whom are united by their common enemy, Iran. Next came another public condemnation of Iran's hardline Islamic leadership. Oppressive regimes cannot endure forever. And the day will come when the people will face a choice. Will they continue down the path of poverty, bloodshed, and terror? Or will the Iranian people return to the nation's proud roots as a center of civilization, culture, and wealth, where their people can be happy and prosperous once again? 
and uh, uncannily but unsurprisingly US Vice President Mike Pence up the ante over the previous weekend of bloody protests across Iran the vice president of the US expressed his country's determination to stand by the Iranian demonstrators and in one of his first two tweets in the new year President Donald Trump reiterated that message American interference in Iran in fact goes back a long way but since President Trump took over in Washington one year back tensions have only worsened can the US really take military or other action against Iran is the question now in the face of the many uncertainties prevailing over Iran's arsenal of weapons and nuclear installations that seems highly unlikely the uprising in Iran seems primarily a domestic one at this point against inflation and joblessness some analysts say that if Washington really wants to see Iran's Islamic leadership ousted its best option may be silence and a wait and watch policy for the Iranian people's movement to generate its own momentum and kick its fundamentalist leadership out. But few in Washington seem inclined to take that option. Trump tweeted about the quote-unquote terrible nuclear deal made by his predecessor Barack Obama, declared that the Iranian people had been repressed for many years and that it's time for change. But do the Iranian people want the United States to bring about that change is the question. The way Tehran goes about managing the protests in Washington's stance in the coming days will then be important indicators. Let's go straight to our guests this evening. We have Daria Safai, human rights activist with us from California, Professor Ryan Morrow of the Na uh, National Security Analyst uh, for the Clarion Project, which is an educational organization focused on Islamist extremism and providing a platform for Muslim voices against it, uh, joining us from New Jersey this evening. And uh, Syed Mohammed Marandi, professor at the Tehran University and also a political analyst. Good evening to all of you. Professor Barandi, since you're in Tehran, let's begin with you. Who is behind these protests? Uh, as the Iranian leadership suggests, is it the, the Saudi Arabians, the Israelis and the Americans, or is it the people of Iran who are now tired of, of uh, the high rates of inflation and joblessness? Well, I think you should check your sources first before you write these reports. It's much more complicated than that, and that the Iranians have stated that numerously. Uh, the protests did exist, and they've been going on for months, the, the, these protests that were linked to the collapse of a number of financial institutions where people lost their money. But what happened more recently in Mashhad, uh, a large Iranian city, was that a small group of people entered the protests, and they were much more radical. And uh, they were chanting slogans initially against the president, a certain state institutions and then ultimately the whole state in subsequent days were in future uh, protests and that were in different cities the whole state was uh, attacked as it were in the slogans so on on the first day most of the protesters had nothing to do with these uh, radical uh, influences in the subsequent days then the following day and the day after that, we had uh, fewer people protesting economic problems and we had more but smaller groups uh, protesting and rioting. 21 people have so far been killed, but uh, unlike what you said in the report, they were not all protesters. Three people died because protesters uh, took a um, fire and uh, truck and they pushed it down a hill, they carjacked it, and that uh, fire truck killed the family. They it hit a car, killing the whole family. A number of uh, three, four soldiers have been killed. And a number of the uh, rioters, they were attacking a police station last right. night, uh, trying to take weapons, and they were killed. And I think that, uh, so it's not uh, protesters on the streets being shot at. This is a very misleading representation. With regards to foreign influence, it's, it's, it's obvious that it's there. Social media apps are being used by groups based in the West, mm. and they are telling, they're instigating violence, they're teaching people how to make Molotov cocktails, okay. and Western governments know this and are doing nothing about it. On the other hand, uh, the Mujahideen al terrorist organization, which carried out hundreds of bomb attacks in Tehran during the 1980s, which fought for Saddam Hussein during the Iran-Iraq war. Right. This terrorist organization, which is based in the West, it is involved uh, both officially uh, from, from European countries in North America and their people on the ground, according to the Ministry of Intelligence, have been shooting at police officers 
they've turned okay, burned um, down banks. Okay, let me get in others I, uh, because I have only so much time and I want to cover all the bases. Uh, Professor Ryan Morrow, what is happening uh, uh, in Iran and uh, these allegations of, of uh, Western interference sound quite credible if you if you if you if you look at the Iranian version of things. <laughs> if. The, well, that's not the Iranian version of things. Uh, the social media crackdown is widely reported on. Everybody knows about it. If you're allowed to broadcast out of Iran as your guest is, then there's a reason the regime is allowing it. And so I'm not surprised that we just got the longest advertisement for the Islamic Republic of Iran I have ever heard on TV. Just look at the videos that are out right now on social media, widely available. Talk to any Iranians involved in the opposition that come from all sorts of political and religious backgrounds. Uh, those protesters are not puppets of the Jews, of the Western imperialists. And if you want to take a side, I would encourage you to look at the Iranian constitution that mandates that the terror-sponsoring regime pursue, quote, the downfall of all non-Islamic regimes. That's from your constitution. Okay. Dara Safai. What's your take on what's happening in Iran and where does this leave the people of Iran who may not want the Americans or any, any other foreign power to interfere and yet would want certain changes and will have to fight for it? I am so sorry to hear the first comments on the movements of, uh, of the Iranian people who are bravely uh, in a very huge uh, amount uh, present on the streets of Iran against the theocratic uh, a dictatorship of the Khamenei, which is a long uh, time in power, they are so brave, they don't want any reform in the system because they don't believe in it. It is not only about the economic problems, there is a lot of things behind it. And already such as several times we have uh, been uh, fighting against those uh, problems, which are political problems. Uh, the people are against the foreign uh, political problem of Islamic Republic of Iran and supporting terrorism of the world like Hezbollah and Hamas. They are shouting for freedom. They don't want clerics and no more in the country. They want just a secular uh, system, a secular uh, government. And just making it like it is something that uh, it's made by America or Israel or uh, Mujahideen. It's such a, um, you know, it's such a painful thing. When I think, when I was there in 1999 in front of the University of Tehran, fighting against those discriminatory laws and uh, sneaking like, uh, to, to freedom. And now I hear that it is really painful. The people deserve better and they will earn themselves their own freedom. It's just the support of the world that they need to be, to have more power to go forward. It's not the interference of the any other countries that they need to go forward to where they go. The only thing is that the, sh the world, the international community should, should show mm. that they are observing, that they are helping those people to tell what they want to say and the bring the change up. Pro Professor Varandi, um, I quickly want to ask you, A, do you see the protests growing in the days ahead and uh, uh, with the protests growing, the crackdown also growing, and would you say that the government was caught off guard? Well, first of all, the protests have decreased from the second day, and it's been the rioters that were on the rise for two, three days, and they've declined. But I should point out two things. First of all, your American guest was talking nonsense about the Iranian constitution. I advise your viewers to look online and read the constitution. It is online. Read it for themselves and then see if he's being honest or not. There's nothing about Jews in the Constitution. Of course, Iran is anti-Zionist because Iran is anti-apartheid, just like it was anti-apartheid in South Africa. With regards to your other guess, again, that's uh, it's propaganda. If you look at polls carried out by the University of Maryland, which is not an Iranian university and it's not controlled by the mullahs or whatever she likes to call them, mm. the University of Maryland poll says that, and this is online, your viewers can go and look it up right now, uh, and it is a very credible uh, polling uh, institution at the university. They have shown that Iranians overwhelmingly support Iran's policy in the region, in Syria and Iraq, in fighting against ISIS and other extremist groups. This is not an Iranian pollster. This is a un American university. 
So this is runs against her claim, and I think right. We okay, we seem to have lost the line, and we know that social media is iffy in Iran. Now we've seen the clamp down on. Uh, platforms like Telegram. I'm also out of time on this, so well, good timing, I'd say. Professor Ryan Morrow and uh, Daria Safai, thanks very much for joining us here on Gravitas this evening and for sharing your thoughts.